on, 60 more seconds. Press in before we move forward. not looking at this platform but hands lifted hearts lifted praise is lifted shouts lifted to the king that lets him know that. 
That you would fall on sons and daughters. So
with our own eyes. We're transformed by this one thing to know your presence and see your beauty. I want to behold you, God. I want to behold you, God. I can't get away from this this morning. It's better. morning I tried a lot of different things and I have found out that there is no place like the love like there's no thing like the love of Jesus and there's no place than church right there's no place better than church the courts of the Lord We honor and we bless your name. We honor and 
we bless your name. We honor and we bless your name. We honor and we bless your name. We honor and we bless your name. We honor and we bless your name. Say it again. We honor and we bless your name. Hands up, hands up. We honor and we bless your name. We honor and we bless your name. We honor and we bless your name. We say we honor and we bless your name. 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 We say we honor and we bless your name. 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 Yeah! Come on, bless the name of the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. I command my soul to bless. Jesus. 
his hand. He will draw all men unto himself. Come on. Scream it, yell it, prophesy. Bless your name. We honor and we bless your name. We honor and we bless the name. to take the next couple of moments and worship God in your own way. Let's go. Worship that name. The name that snatched you out of hell. And the name that's going to allow you to walk on streets paved with gold. Come on, fella, out of your belly. Lift up a shout. Lift up a scream. Lift up a yell. What a beautiful name it is. Hey. What a beautiful name it is. Lift those hands and say, What a beautiful name it is. Say it. What a beautiful name it is. Hey. What a beautiful name it is. are troubled. I don't know what you walked in here with, but it's about to fall off of you. It's about to get under the water. I don't know what you're dealing with online. I don't know what you're facing Facebook, but I'm telling you, your next shout is about to set you free. Everybody scream right now. Those hands up and say that. Come on, say, say, what a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name. 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 It is what a beautiful how powerful it is how wonderful it is how glorious it is I feel one more thing look down at your feet and say the waters are troubled as Lisa began to sing better is one day in your courts Better is one day. And as she began to sing that, I start thinking about some days that we've had where we said things like, God, if I can just feel your presence today. God, if I can just experience your power like I did yesterday. <laughs> okay, let's get personal. God, if I can have on me what I had on me before I got to Valor. Look at you, y'all quiet because you're nervous. No need to be nervous. I come to tell you today that the waters are troubled. And whatever you were before you got here, God's about to increase it in this moment of worship. And when she starts singing that, I, I, I just went off somewhere. And I made this determination that if I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord, I'm not going to go halfway. If, if I'm going to be under this anointing and this glory, I refuse to give God a halfway praise. And then I start thinking about the prophet that said that there's coming a moment where you have a decision you have to make. 
Are you going to stay ankle deep? Because the water is moving higher, but are you going to just stay ankle deep? Or are you going to go knee deep, waist deep, or even to your head? Or are you going to let this thing go over your head? And since I'm here, Come on. Yeah. since I've been through all that I've been through, y'all looking at me, I'm talking about you. Start thinking about yourself. If I'm going to be here, I'm going, Miss Lisa, all the way in. And I start singing that song. I'm going ankle deep, waist deep, all the way in. See, because see, that's the, that's the question. Not necessarily is God asking you, but that's the question you have to ask yourself. Are you going to get everything that God has for you? Or are you going to make the decision just to sit there and watch that person get everything that God has for them? But I'm just crazy enough to believe today that I am in a room with a bunch of people that says, I refuse not to go all the way in. So for the next couple of moments, because there's a word in the house that's going to come forth. But I do think we might as well swim in this water that's troubled this day. And this is what I believe, that some of your hearts are about to open up. The Bible talks about how God wants to make an, an exchange. He wants to take out your stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. But guess what? You can never have that surgical procedure if you don't make the decision to lay down on the table. No doctor's gonna force you to have surgery. Watch this. You gotta sign some papers. <laughs> you have to make up in your mind that you're gonna do this. So guess what? Some of you today could get left because I'm not gonna force you to do anything. I'm just asking you to swim in deep waters with me this morning. Who's ready to go deeper in God this morning? Come on, oh, lift your hands and begin to pray in that heavenly language. Come on, come on, begin to stir yourself up this morning. Tell God I'm willing to go through this surgical procedure. I'm willing for you to take out of me everything that doesn't belong there. And God, open me up to put in me everything that should be there. Come on. I need those desperate people that said, honey, I see you. I see you. Come on, pray. Make yourself cry. They that hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Here's the good news. If you make yourself hungry this morning, if you make yourself thirsty, here's the promise. God is a about to fill you in these next couple of moments. All the desperate people begin to give God a desperate cry. Begin to give God a desperate plea. Begin to tell God that you're going all the way. And I'm going ankle deep, waist deep, all the way in. Come on, make that your cry. Going ankle deep, waist deep, all the way in. Come on, make that your cry. Come on, get those hands up and say
sweep me away with you. Sweep me away. Sweep me away with you. There's a hunger and a thirst. I am desperate. Immerse me. I'm not wavy, not anymore. See, Nicole Binion would say it like this. Will you still be hungry after all these years? Yeah. Can you still be thirsty after all these years? Can you still be hungry yeah. after all When um, our little girls were little, and some of us in this room are young, right? Not everybody's in their 40s. Most of you are in your 20s. And I remember as a mom, I learned to distinguish very quickly the cry of my child yeah. and when I knew that my babies were crying because they were hungry I would say baby hold on just a minute mama's getting you food it's coming right and now they're older and can talk and they say, Mama, I'm hungry. My belly is rumbling. Y'all need to hear me in the spirit this morning. 
right? My belly is empty, it's growling, it's making noise that I can't control. And see, that's what some of our spirits are doing this morning. And some of you are like, whoa, like I've never felt like this before. It's your hunger talking. Yes, yes, yes. See, because when you're really hungry, you're only making a verbal expression of what your spirit is crying out for. So cry out, cry out this morning, cry out. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The psalmist said, Oh God, you are my God, and early will I seek you. My soul longs for you in a dry and thirsty land. And listen, Valor, don't ever let your soul stop longing, because it's in that longing that you pursue and in that pursuit that you find. Yes, yes, yes. We're not here just to be another group of Christians at a college. We're here to encounter God. We're here to not only encounter God, but to change the world. That's why God brought you here. And what we experience in chapel is just a simple taste of what God has for each and every one of us every single day. You see, because would you, as you pursue him, he said, you seek for me, you'll find me yeah. when you search for me with all of your heart. Yes, yes, yes. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. He's near to us. Yeah. Amen. Remain in this attitude of worship as you make your way back to your seat. We are so privileged this morning to have a Valor alumni graduated World Harvest Bible College in 2006. Pastor R.D. Smith, he and his wife Kim are on staff here at World Woo! Harvest. And we are thankful. For the gifts and ministries of this ministry family. Pastor R.D., would you come and bring the word this morning? Woo! Give him a warm valor welcome. Woo! All right, R.D., here we go. World Harvest Church, Valor Christian College. You want to school here? This is not that big of a deal. Just don't freak out. Don't do it, don't freak out, don't make this a bigger issue than it is, don't freak out. Look, you know all these people that sit in the front row, it's not that big of a deal, Utter remains there, Kim's there, wave to Kim, smile and wave, it's not that big of a deal. Wait, what are you talking about, it's not that big of a deal, it's World Harvest Church. Do you know who has preached in this pulpit? Pastor Rod Parsley at camp meeting just this year, Pastor Stephen Furtick, Pastor Sammy Rodriguez. What are you even doing? There are literally like 50 cameras staring at you right now. Don't freak out. Don't freak out all the cameras. You're online. You're online on Facebook right now. There's like 40 
2,000 people that are watching you on Facebook right now. Your mom and dad are probably watching. Wave your mom. Hi, mom. This is ridiculous. Just keep it together. Do not mess this up. That's what it is. You're going to mess it up, so just try to say something. Say anything. Where's the microphone? Do you even have the microphone? Pick the mic up and say something. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, that was uh, a little bit awkward. So why don't you try saying something again, and then this time you actually say something. Uh, sorry, guys. It took me a minute. I had to kind of collect my thoughts there. It's a little bit awkward when you get to stand up on a platform like this for a ministry like this that's been built by spiritual giants. We're so lucky to be able to be in a place based off the vision of a man like Pastor Rod Parsley, and we're so excited to be able to be here for it. But I almost wish for one minute that you guys could have actually heard what my thoughts were as I stood there because I'm freaking out a little bit. And I think if we were being honest this morning and you could have heard my thoughts, they probably sound an awful lot like the thoughts that you guys have every single day. The reality of it is, is we all are in a place in our life where there's something to freak out about. And I don't know about you, you guys don't have to hang out, you can go, go back to your seats. But when the opportunity comes to freak out, there's always people that God puts in my life that come up to me and they say things like, hey man, just wanna let you know that you're awesome, just wanna let you know that things, things are going great, that you're doing this, you're doing that, and then the worst thing ever is when people say this to me, they say, you know what man, it's not that big of a deal, just don't freak out. Has anyone ever had someone say that to you? Don't freak out. Like, I got a news flash for you. When you tell me not to freak out, I'm already triggered because I'm freaking out, yeah. right? It's like when your wife calls or your girlfriend or, or your boss or somebody, and they start the conversation like this, they say, hey, uh, before, don't get mad. And you're like, too late, because I'm already there. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and get the, the Landon Bella story out of the way at the front. Th this has happened to me over and over in my life. My wife here, uh, it, Kim is in the front row. She's amazing. She's beautiful. And I love you. You guys probably love her too. She works with a lot of you. Uh, a couple years ago, I was actually about 30 minutes away from walking into my youth ministry at the time. I was a youth minister uh, to, to pastor a bunch of kids that I was honestly just getting ready to know. And Pro tip for you guys that are going to be youth pastors, there is an awkward transition stage when you become a youth pastor of a church, and you walk up in your first week, and no one knows who you are. It's just weird. So, like, write that down. It's going to be okay. Don't freak out, right? And I walked in to the youth group, and I'm, I'm walking through the, the, the church, and I get a phone call from my wife, and it starts like this, and she says, hey, don't get mad, but, and I'm like, let me just stop you. I already am. And she's like, and then Landon, uh, who is like, like little Hercules and breaks everything and climbs everything anyway, um, decided that at like, he, how old was he? Like six months old, maybe. Like Landon is a baby, baby. And I had been like teaching him how to play football. And I had this little heavy black speaker that kind of looked like a football. And he decided that he was going to throw it around the living room, except for the fact is that he threw it directly through our brand new 70 inch plasma TV. So when you say, don't get mad, and then tell me that, guess what? I'm already going to be mad. The reality of it is, is we are walking in a season right now of revival. We are. And you can choose to either step into the revival, or you can choose to wave at the revival as it passes by. It's like undeniable the things that God has been doing. Sometimes I, I really feel like, we're so spoiled rotten to be in the place that we're able to be and to be surrounded by this continuous cloud of God that we're surrounded by. That crazy, ridiculous revival and moves of God have just become so normal that we're like, yeah, my church people get healed every Sunday. That's not normal everywhere that you go. 
We're in an undeniable season right now of revival, but you have to understand that when you walk into an undeniable season of revival, you also are walking into an undeniable, unquestioned, and in your life likely unprecedented season of attack. So I'll be honest with you, part of the reason I'm freaking out today is because the last time that I got to, to be on this pulpit or be on this platform and preach um, was the Wednesday night before DCM started, like a week before DCM. And some of you guys might remember that message, some of you might not. I preached a message um, that was called Trust the Process. Um, there are a couple things in life that you should never do. You should never pray for patience, ever, and I learned the very next day that you should never preach a message called trust the process. You just shouldn't do those things. The next day, beyond all the craziness that was going on with camp meeting, finding out that this awesome new set was gonna be late and delayed and stuck in like California somewhere, not getting here in time. I get a phone call in the middle of the day that my wife had been rear-ended by a guy going 50 miles an hour when she was at a dead stop, and that was that day. When you go through things and you go to new levels in your walk with God and your relationship with God, when you find a time of revival in your life, it is going to cost you something. So you have to like, just indulge me a little bit as I explain why I'm freaking out a little bit. Because the reality of it is, as I stand here right now, I understand there's a target that comes on me, it comes on every single one of you. When I'm telling you, don't freak out because the attack's coming, it's just letting you realize, hey guys, it's coming. If I were to have you raise your hands right now, I'm sure that 80% of this room would be like, you know what, Pastor RD, the attack is already here. You know what, your thoughts were my thoughts because I deal with that every single morning of the world. And so today, we're just gonna talk a little bit about what that looks like some ways that we can deal with that, and then really, more than anything, how do we recognize the symptoms of what happens when we freak out? So just to make sure we're all awake, look at your neighbor, we get like real old school churchy, and just tell them this morning, as loud as you can, say, don't freak out, man, like, just don't freak out. If you guys have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 Samuel 17. Uh, this is, uh, gonna get a lot deeper than it sounds like it's gonna get, but 1 Samuel 17, we see um, a story that we've probably been told since we were like in diapers. It's a story of, of David getting ready and preparing to face off with Goliath. So we have David who is this little farm uh, shepherd. Uh, Miss Lisa quoted me a couple weeks ago. She called him a pizza delivery boy. I was like, yeah, that's how you know you've arrived when you say things and Miss Lisa starts using it. A guy that, that was a lot like us, from nowhere, knew new one, had no reason to be anything except for the fact that there was an anointing that had been placed on his life. That's important. Because much like a lot of you, I'm from nowhere. I knew no one. But as we walk through this season of revival and as the attacks come, and as the fights come, it's important to understand and to know that you have been anointed. Yeah. Yeah. So it's David versus Goliath. David, little farm boy, that's nobody versus Goliath, who is Goliath. <laughs> A giant, man-eating, army-destroying war machine, the likes of which Marvel and DC could have never dreamt up on their best day. And this enemy comes against the people of God, the children of Israel, and is threatening them, is mocking them. His record of wins and fatalities speak for itself. There's no one that can stop this giant Goliath, and he knows that he's bad to the bone. And David has decided he's having none of it. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm believing that I'm standing in a room full of people, a room full of Davids who have decided no matter what the fight is coming, no matter what's being said to me, no matter the attacks of the enemy, no matter what the odds say, no matter how many times I've seen him win or seen me lose, I'm not gonna have any of it so you can just stop running your mouth, devil, right now because I know that I've been anointed. The funny thing about freaking out is this. Most of you and most of us don't freak out in the fight, we freak out because we think the fight's coming, right? Like, you actually get into it, and in a lot of cases, you just kind of start reacting. You start dealing with whatever you have to deal with. 
As Dory said, you just keep swimming, right? But it's in that moment, those small moments right before the fight actually starts when you, you realize that it's coming and you start thinking, oh man, what's going on? We start freaking out. And the reason it's dangerous to freak out because the first thing that freaking out in the midst of a battle, in the midst of a fight does is it makes you question who you even are. It's like, why am I here? God, like everything was cool when I was back home and my mom made my bed and toilet paper was free. How many of you guys realize toilet paper is not free in your first, first semester students? Anybody? That was a wake up call for me. First time I went to the Walmart in Canal Winchester down here down the road and realized that I needed toothpaste and deodorant and hairspray and toilet paper and soap and all those sorts of things that always happens at the exact same time. Like, has anyone run out of everything like that at the same time every single week? And it was like $65 and I called my mom and I was like, mom, I just spent $60 on nothing. And she was like, you're welcome. So it's easy to look back and say, man, before I was here, before I was in this place, before I was walking in the place I know that God's called me, it's easy to say, why am I even here and what am I even doing? What is the purpose? Because I had it so much better, God, before I actually listened to what you told me to do. Maybe I'm just preaching to me this morning. So many times... We allow our freakouts to dictate our view of ourself, to dictate our view of God, to dictate what our next step is supposed to be. And so let me give you the spoiler alert, the end of this story, right up at the front so we can get on the same page. Freaking out is simply this. When you choose to try to handle it yourself instead of letting God handle it, you freak out. Because when you try to handle the situation that you're up against in your life, instead of letting God deal with it or letting God lead you through it, you realize real quick that you don't have it in you to do it and it falls apart. So we can't freak out. Let's go to 1 Samuel, jump into this thing a little bit so we can see what's happened. Like I said, David uh, has heard Goliath talking trash. He's decided that he's not gonna have any of it. David actually uses some tough talk of his own and then in uh, 1 Samuel 17, starting in 31, it says this. When the words that David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, who was the king. And then Saul the king sent for David, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail them on account of themselves. Let no man's heart fail on account of him, for your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Let me give you the Pastor RD translation. Don't freak out, I got this. David knew he was anointed. He knew there was a call in his life and he knew that the situation that he was facing was not of God. And so he knew that he had authority over what was getting ready to take place. In the midst of watching the armies of Israel panic and freak out, he had the wherewithal in and of himself to say, you know what, I know there's a God that's bigger than me and I know there's a God that's bigger than this giant. Don't freak out, I got this. And when he walked in that anointing that had been placed on his life, it's something that's really, really important for you to understand. Very important that you get this. That when you walk in the confidence of the anointing that God's placed on you, it's not only going to let you be ready for that attack. It's not going to prepare you for that fight. But it's actually going to open doors for you to be able to impact a change in that situation. Look at this. David is nobody, literally walks off the farm and within moments, he's brought to stand in front of the king. The anointing that you carry on your life will open the door for you to stand in front of people that can effect change, not just in your own life, but in your world. David was nobody, but he walked in the anointing that God had for him. David tells the armies, don't freak out. I got this. He tells the king. And it's funny because this leads to Saul kind of listening in a moment. But the reality of the attack that we find ourselves in, of the attacks that you will face, that look, guys, like, let's just, can we be real for two minutes? They don't stop. Like your Christian walk 
I don't know who told you that you were gonna get saved and then one day it was just gonna be like rainbows and unicorns and happiness, right? Because in my life, and maybe I'm just a little jacked up, it feels like I'm going from like one 12 round fight to the next 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 12 round fight to the draw to the loss to the loss to the loss to the loss to the fight to the fight to the fight and it's really really easy for me to be like God what am I doing wrong it's really easy for me in the middle of the never ending waves of fights that it seems like you're coming up against to feel like, why me, God? Like, we're doing everything we can. How are you gonna let my wife get hit by a car going 50 miles an hour? We're doing everything we can. How is it this comes up? And I, I'm just gonna be really transparent. Like, we've been going through stuff during this revival. Like, a lot of us, have been swinging the sword as hard as we've ever swung the sword. And for me and my family, just yesterday, it went to like a new level of silliness and fight. I took my wife to lunch before church last night. We went to, to go get something to eat. She got probably the safest food in the history of the world that you can get. She got a boneless chicken wing, which is like... from doing you're not just walking through it because you got bad luck we got to stop walking around with the pity party oh God why is it always me it's not always you and it's only you that feels like it's only always you and it's you because there's a call greater on you than the enemy can let go unattended if you're coming against Goliath it's because God knows that you have something inside of you that can take down Goliath. David knew from the beginning he had it inside of him. And look at this, no one else knew it. If we go forward in that scripture, right after David is told Saul, hey, don't freak out, I got this. The very next thing in verse 83 that happens, Saul says to David, you are not going to be able to go against this Philistine and fight him. Saul gives David the classic, nah, bro. You are a kid. You're just a youth, the Bible says. And Goliath has been a warrior and undefeated since his youth. Since he was your age, he's been killing guys just like you. Here's what you gotta understand. You have to begin to do two things. Thing number one, surround yourself with people who can look at you when you chip your tooth and B-dubs and say, look, this is just a thing. There's a reason why you're going through this. And that can encourage you to go through it. Number two, you have to realize that there's gonna be very, very, very few of those people that are in your life that are gonna be in your corner and encourage you, and most of them are gonna pull what Saul pulled on David and say, you can't do this, and you have to know that because you're not freaking out, you know that you have it too, and you can still keep moving on. Because there's no record in the Bible of David saying, you know what, Saul, you're right. Maybe I shouldn't do this. That's not how it works. Freaking out does another thing, other than just making you question who you are, other than making you question what God's doing in your life, other than making you question why you're following God in your everyday. When you freak out, you will start to do this. You will start to compare yourself to everyone and everything else to try to do what I said Kim did yesterday. Is it just me? 
Am I the only one? Or even more dangerous, how many like preacher types we have in this room? How many of you guys feel like you're called to preach? Anybody? You're called to pastor? Let me help you out. Get off of social media. Because when you're in that moment of attack, when you're in that moment of a fight, all of a sudden your Instagram is gonna blow up with 17 fire 60 second clips of some preacher and you're gonna start to compare yourself to him and be like, I'm never gonna be that. But I got news for you. It takes more than 60 seconds for God to move. And when you keep judging yourself what, by what you're seeing in other places, that's really a snapshot of the best of the best of the best of the best. You can never compare that to what God's called you to do. When you start to compare yourself, you will begin to lose yourself. Because you're so worried about what this person or that person is saying or doing or the success that you think that you see. That's what's so funny about Instagram. And really, I, I don't do Snapchat, but I had it long enough for my daughter to play with it for me to figure it out like what. It, like sometimes I can see a picture, I'm like, oh, that's a Snapchat filter. And the funny thing is, some of these ladies and these women feel like no one gets that they're being filtered, right? Like it's hilarious. I could go through my timeline right now and like almost every female on my timeline has at least five pictures of themselves with that ridiculous filter that like squishes their face in and softens their skin and makes their, che their cheeks pink. And then, then they almost look like these like Japanese anime cartoons in their eyes. Like that just happens, right? But we, we see these things and we start to compare ourselves against those things and then we start to tear ourselves down in those things because the reality of it is we're relying on ourselves and we're just freaking out and you just can't freak out, right? We start to compare yourself to others, it gets to be a really dangerous place and I'll be honest with you, specifically in ministry, it gets really dangerous. Like if you are standing up in a pulpit and preaching based off of, well, I hope I can get a good clip out of this, you're not focused on what God's actually called you to do in that moment. If you walk off of a platform and all you're worried about is how many likes that you've acquired, your heart's not really in the right place. You have been called to make an impact beyond some digital forum. You have been called to walk constantly in anointing, not just 60 seconds at a time. So don't let yourself compare yourself to others because comparison gets real dangerous. Like I said, it, it'll make you question who you are. It'll also make you uh, change your appearance. It'll open you to things that you're not necessarily always open to. So we'll go back to the scripture here. David tells Saul, chill, I got this. Saul says to David, no, there's no way you can do it. David pushes back and says, but I've, I've done this in the past. I've beat the lion, I've beat the bear. I've killed both of those things barehanded. This, is, this uncircumcised Philistine, the Bible says, will be just like this them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. I know that God delivered me from the, the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me from the, the hand of this Philistine. And Saul says, go, let the Lord be with you. But then Saul also decides that telling David to go was not enough. I'm going to backtrack a minute. Remember what I said about surrounding yourself with people that you know are going to have your back in every situation? That means that you need to surround yourself with people that are gonna keep you on task when you get it right, when you get it wrong. You need to surround yourself with people specifically in ministry and specifically in your family life that love you enough to tell you you don't look like you right now. And the reality of it is when you're walking through attack, when you're preparing for battle, there are going to be opportunities for you to not look like you. And in this moment, David's not, even though he's, he's in the presence of greatness, he's been taken to a place where he can impact a culture. The reality of it is Saul begins to get selfish. And Saul says to David, but before you go, let me give you my armor to protect yourself. Now, I don't do math really well. 
To be honest, half the reason I chose to come to World Harvest Bible College was because at the time there was no math here. I was like, that's the place for me. Shonda. I'll do math real well, but let me help you walk through this equation. Saul knows that his armor is custom fitted for Saul. Saul has just told David, you are a little kid. It's never going to fit him. So how in the world does it make any sense for David to walk out onto a battlefield against an undefeated foe wearing Saul's armor? The only thing that makes any sense to me is this. In David explaining to Saul the anointing that had been on his life, in David explaining to Saul that God would surely deliver him from the hand of this Philistine, Saul thought, maybe this kid's going to do it. Maybe he's going to pull one of the greatest upsets of all time. Maybe he's actually going to win this thing. But what happens if he does and some nobody shepherd boy, boy kills a Philistine instead of the king that's supposed to be leading these armies. So Saul decides, if you're gonna be successful, you're gonna look like I'm the one that's being successful. Saul didn't give David his armor in any effort at all to protect him. Saul put his armor on David so that the people that watched the fight would think that it was Saul that killed the giant. And when you are walking through battles in your life, if you are not surrounded by the right people, you will find yourself in the presence of others that want to piggyback on the success that God has set you up for and not only piggyback it, but in the name of helping you will try to set themselves up to be the one that did the thing in the first place. I'm just trying to help you guys out today. We're not taking an offering, Elder G, chill. <laughs> the reality of it is this, you are anointed and God puts something on you and you don't need to look like anybody else when you're walking through what God has called you to do. So don't worry about that. Just don't worry about comparing yourself to this person and that person. I used to laugh my head off. I got in so much trouble when I was, a, I honestly can't believe they ever let me come back because I can't tell you how many times I would find myself sitting in, um, we didn't have the awesome lounge that you guys have now in Valor. In the dorms, we had a couple of like um, normal like TV areas. There was one upstairs, there was one downstairs. Not to like get off on personal like reminiscing or nostalgic stories, but like the first week that I was here, um, my Maryland Terrapins were playing against North Carolina and I was trying to watch that upstairs in like the, the room cause I was all by myself. And then like three guys came in and they're like, but there's this revival on TBN. And I was like, not right now there's not. Right now there's a basketball game that was on. And I got like lectured by the RA and sent to my room. <laughs> like, so I was kind of surprised that I even ever found myself in this place because I didn't necessarily always feel like I fit. But I'll never forget also sitting in one of those rooms. Uh, a, a student came up with me um, and sat down next to me. And sometimes in the dorms, I love you guys, but we can get a little spiritual in the dorms. Like I'm trying to brush my teeth. I don't need to be prophesied to right now. Was Maybe that's just me. Um, but I was in a situation like that. I was just kind of sitting on the couch and someone came up to me and they were like, you know, RD, we're so lucky to be here because we're being molded into being the next Rod Parsley. And pastor, I love you with all of my heart. You know that I do. But I never, ever have felt like I've been called to be the next Rod Parsley. That's not a slight against Rod Parsley. That's not a slight against our pastor. But we have got to stop seeing things and trying to rip those things off. Because... It's not that you shouldn't emulate greatness. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you shouldn't try to steal it and act like it's yours. This, this kid w was like saying to me that he was so excited to go preach at his turn to preach in our preaching lab. And then he got on the platform and proceeded for 15 minutes to do the best Pastor Rod Parsley impression I have ever seen. He was grabbing the back of his head. He was, ah, ah, ah. I mean, it was all of it. 
And I, and I said, like, no offense to anyone, but like God's put something in me. He wants me to be the next R.D. Smith. And, and it's, again, it's not against anybody. You can't compare yourself because you're freaking out to other people and then just try to steal the anointing that they have. You're not going to be Stephen Furtick. And God never called you to be Stephen Furtick. He didn't call you to be Francis Chan. He didn't call you to be Joyce Meyer. He didn't call you to be any of the people that you go on social media and perceive that they've got it right. He's called you to be you. And when you rely on you, you'll see yourself pulling back from the anointing that God's put on you and start putting on the anointing of somebody else in an attempt to make it fit. And David, we see in this moment, he lets that happen. He let Saul put his image on him. But immediately, he has the common sense to go, this is never gonna work. It's so funny. The Bible says it, one of the translations I was reading last night says it this way. He said to the king, King Saul, I can't wear this because I've never walked in it. Let that sink in. You can't try to emulate someone else's anointing and put that anointing on you and operate in excellence because you've never walked in what they've walked in. You've never put in what they put in to be anointed in that way. And so David realized immediately that it would only hurt his chances of victory instead of propelling him to victory because he had never walked in it. When we freak out, man, the reality of it is it just takes you completely off course. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through every single line of the scripture. It's in your Bible. You have one. I would encourage you to read it. But the long story short is after David takes Saul's armor off, he goes back to the things that are familiar to him, the things that he had walked in, the things that he had used before. He went back to his shepherding tools, his staff, his sling, the things that he was comfortable with, the things that he had been trained in. Again, because he had that confidence in who God had called him to be. He understood the anointing that had been placed on him. He understood that it was God that would give him the victory. It had nothing to do with his skill. At no point do we see David saying, you know, I'm a master Jedi ninja, completely trained my entire life in the art of murder, which is what we would think is what it took to defeat, to defeat Goliath. David relied continually on the fact, I know that my God is going to give me victory in this situation. When you allow yourselves to freak out, when you rely on yourself instead of relying on what God has placed in you and what God wants to do through you, you will find yourself forgetting about the weapons that you've been trained with. So what are those weapons? Your prayer life, your worship life, the anointing that's been placed on you itself is a weapon that you can never replace. And when we start to freak out, we forget about all those things. I guarantee you every single time that you walk into a situation and you start freaking out, and you start like shadow boxing, and you start just trying to not drown, you will see yourself immediately walk away from your prayer life. That's just the instinct. You stop praying, and you start internalizing on what it is that you can do to fix it. So we lay that weapon down. Maybe I'm just preaching to myself. But when you're walking through the fight and you get in your car and a worship song that you know has taken you in in the past comes on, like 12 times out of 10, I just mute it because I don't even want to hear it. It has nothing to do with the fact that I don't love Jesus. 
It has to do with the fact that as I'm freaking out and relying on me and the fight that I'm going through, it's really easy for me to lay my weapons down. When you lay those weapons down, all that you're doing is setting yourself up for catastrophic failure. Could you imagine someone walking into the king's presence with all the confidence that David had if he wasn't anointed to do what he was getting ready to do? Like, this story would be real quick, real fast, game over. David walks out to Goliath in Saul's armor, gets squashed, and we move on. And I don't want any of you or any of you that are online that are watching this dealing with the same types of things to walk into this situation, to walk into this fight, to walk into these things that have been coming against you in your everyday life, having freaked out, having relied on yourself instead of relying on God and what God wants to do for you, having laid down your weapons, having attempted to put on someone else's armor and walk into that and walk onto the battlefield and get squashed and we move on. God has victory in your plans. You've been called to greatness. You've been called to impact greatness. You've been called to change the world that you live in every single day. And you'll never, ever, ever, ever do that when you freak out and when you question who you are because you're freaking out and when you question who God is because you freak out and when you try to compare yourself to other people because you're freaking out and when you lay down your weapons and the only things that you have to battle in this fight, you do all that because you're freaking out and relying on you. I'm gonna wrap up today with one final story, which I was thought about a lot in the last couple of months. Um, it's funny, it happened here on this property um, back in front of uh, Bradley B area, which at the time, we still do have youth down there again, but at the time, youth was in what's now the Breakthrough Studio, which is really weird because this conversation effectively happened where I work every single day of my life. And um, you guys may not know this, but during my time in Valor, I did a little bit of everything. It was actually it was World Harvest Bible College. Uh, back at that time. And um, I was in the music department and uh, I attempted to play drums. It was an interesting kind of a story at that time because I'm from like a straight up like Hillsong whitest church ever. And at the time that is not at all what we played. And I had the distinct privilege of being the chapel drummer that had to come after Eddie Villar graduated. For those of you guys that know Eddie Villar and Miss Becca, and Eddie's a monster. And I found myself in band trying to compare myself to people like Eddie or to Tuan at the time or to Bear who was here. Bear, if you happen to be watching, you know that I love you. Um, and just all the time freaking out. Like, it was a mess. It honestly gets to the point where it's like quicksand because you're like in chapel and you're not doing it <laughs> and everyone knows that you're not doing it and you're just kind of like, I don't know what to do with my hands right now, which when you're a drummer, it's really bad to not know what to do with your hands. And um, I didn't think that anyone really knew that I was kind of freaking out about it and then this one random night before youth group had started, um, Miss Lisa, who was our music director in Valor, back in the day, um, stopped me in the hallway, like completely at random, and was like, you don't have to be what all these other guys are. Like, it's okay for you to just be you. And I haven't, I think I've told her this once or twice, but what seemed like a really insignificant conversation at literally where I work every day now, <laughs> like completely changed the whole trajectory of my ministry because I know that I'm different. And I know that what God has put in me is different than what a lot of people see or expect. But because I was surrounded by good people at a very early and impressionable time, I understood that it was okay to be who God called you to be. So I'm here to tell you guys today hopefully in a way that impacts you the way that Miss Lisa did when I was 19 years old, which was way longer ago than I want to admit, that it is okay for you to walk in the anointing 
that God has placed on your life. That you don't have to compare that anointing to anyone else's. That all that you have to do is keep your focus on him, keep your faith in him, and don't freak out when the battle comes. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you've put in us. We thank you for the anointing that you've given each and every single one of us. And God, we ask that in the midst of every fight that we come against, in the midst of every attack that comes at us, against us, that everything that tries to shake our faith or shake us from knowing who you are in us, God, that we would not freak out. God, that we wouldn't try to take what you're doing into our, our own hands, that we wouldn't forsake you, that we wouldn't lay our weapons down. God, that we would keep our eyes set on you, that we would walk in the anointing that you've placed on us, and that we would know that that's good enough, and that's exactly what you had for us all along. And God, that through doing that, you would raise us up and put us in places to make an impact on others and impact your kingdom. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for all that you're doing in the lives of each and every Valor student and the lives of everyone that's watching us online. God, we believe that this was for someone today. We thank you for all that you're doing. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Can we thank God for Pastor R.D. Smith? What a word. Hey, we want to say to our online family, we love you. Thank you for joining us. We will be right back here next Thursday morning at 10. But before then, come celebrate with us this Sunday morning. Um, we're going to have an amazing time in the presence of the Lord. So can we celebrate our online family as we're saying goodbye to them?